मॉर्निंग एंड वेलकम टू गना शॉर्ट और गना शॉर्ट में आप सबका स्वागत है आज हम बात करेंगे विद अनंत मिश्रा एंड अनंत मिश्रा इज इन पैरिस पैरिस में ही इज गॉन टू अटेंड द डिफेंस एंड स्ट्रेटेजिक फोरम राइट विच इज रन बाय द फ्रेंच डिफेंस यूनिवर्सिटी एंड अदरवाइज इट इज नोन एज एकोल दी मिलिटेर ओके एंड वट आर द सब्जेक्ट ही स्पोक ऑन ही स्पोक ऑन Europe at the crossroads. Now, with this as a backdrop, we'll invite Anant over. Anant, morning. How are you? And how's Paris? Morning to you, sir. And I'm very glad, sir, to giving me the opportunity to come back again. Um, sir, Paris. Uh, it's a bit cold in the morning, but the temperature is a little warmer. Uh, Paris is okay. at the crossroads of two, as as the title itself says, Europe at the crossroads. After Brexit, uh, the, all eyes uh, were on France and Germany, uh, but after the Euro-Ukraine war, all eyes are on France. After Gaza, Fran- French uh, diplomacy became, um, I would say, at the helm of uh, European politics. Uh, something which was visible in the conference as well. uh so the conference was structured into various themes and thematics uh of spanning over a time frame of two days um there were engagements with with respect to uh let's say public private funding uh power perception and propaganda talking about how the uh, how the war is going to go um with the uh, information war with the tincture of information war in there there were two exclusive sessions for war games uh the french lithuanian defense industry forum was also something that was very keenly highlighted because the president of lithuania uh, uh was was in the attendance uh, he gave the inaugural uh, address at the opening ceremony uh, then there is something known as uh, the fundamental role of airspace so now aerospace power is something that the europeans have, have realized although they have been there were arguments as to will they were late to re- uh, you know reorganize their strength in terms of air power um in 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 ta- in times like these there was an emphasis on two conferences two particular uh, meetings in this conference which pan down on both the days war in ukraine two years on and what the just the uh, adjustments it has done and the significant impact of the war in gaza its consequences in the mediterranean sea um which uh, i would uh, i would uh, i would say a hone on to uh, for our audiences today Um, yeah no, sir uh, i i think we'll do it in two parts we first okay. cover the ukrainian issue and then we'll talk about the uh, you know west asia crisis and gaza and all that so so that you know we get a flavor of what's the thinking on both these in europe absolutely now sir uh, the french uh, the french diplomacy is currently being looked at as to uh, from the gambit of um, you know how a uh, potentially france can potentially unite the european because uh, when we see the russians invasion of ukraine and at the large scale you know the scale of war of aggression which is essentially everybody in european union is seeing as an intention to enter into a european soil um the the uh, the russian aggression was uh, i would say not viewed in those exactly sentiments in paris now uh, there are there is a, one thing known as a moment of european unity which is a kind of a reaction that comes up when the when the russian invasion of uh, ukraine happened uh, vis-a-vis moscow uh, there were a lot of engagements between the european countries as well as their engagements with with moscow in the initial stages uh, on ukrainian refugees uh, in addition to what is going to happen to the syrian which are already there the syrian and the sudanese refugees which already had divided the european union in 2010 now in addition to this uh, the europeans uh, so the eu is essentially looking at france for uh, in the context of uh, political humanitarian human you know humanitarian and diplomatic and economic solidarity um, but it's highly likely because the european union budget itself or i would rather quote it as the peace facility is is uh, delivering arms to to ukraine of almost like 3.3 billion euros in addition to this now uh, the visit of ukrainian president zelensky to brussels in february 2023 uh, was was uh, of a huge was i would say was echoed um, where he not only thanked the european but we also said you know it's a rare opportunity where we should come together but um, 
it's it's highly likely whether uh, uh, the same sentiments are being reflected in paris because uh, at the strategic level the traditional supporters of european defense uh, which currently plays the bulk of their efforts um, in in the essence of what we can say european pillar of you know the atlantic alliance and nato's comprehensive concept which was again updated in the madrid uh, madrid summit all of these sentiments are not to be an, uh, is something that i did not find in paris because uh, paris in equivocally uh, unequivocally has not is is has not criticized now at least this is my interpretation and i am uh, i'm uh, as i say i'm a scholar who interprets from from uh, only the perspective that is available to me but this is a perception that i felt that paris has not criticized but paris on the on the contrary has not even uh, i would say did not sh shy away from not engaging uh, or not even engaging the uh, you know uh, the possibility of uh, let's say a bilateral or a talk with moscow in years to come this is something that um, uh, paris has not uh, said it unequivocally now uh, that the reason why the reason why the situation uh, this this entire situation is the reason between the tension between germany and france and uh, like you know like all power economies this is the emerging tension that is is going to come up uh, in europe in times to come now european union center of gravity is eastwards and northwards that means countries like poland now sees itself as a new center of you know new europe from a strategic point of view the polish authorities believe that the germans and the french uh, you know were wrong not to listen to their numerous warnings when they said that the russian threat has come up especially since the annexation of crimea in 2014 2014 but like the european countries directly exposed to threat uh, germans have i would say compromised with russia by increasing their dependence on gas uh but emmanuel macron has shown himself to be far too conciliatory by receiving putin in versailles uh brigenson and then calling not to as i said not to humiliate russia in the middle of a war so when olaf scholz gave the paris but the, the prague speech uh, you can see this as an attempt to send a message of again openness and reconciliation to the countries of central eastern and nordic regions now this means that the franco german relationship is not mentioned in the speech if you if you read that speech he does not mention at all about the franco german relationship which suggests that german intends to play the full strength of its national unity or the sense of national sentiment um to to you know to to keep the momentum with these countries uh now the european union center of gravity is in in 2024 this is what i see because with the current stand that the the french and the germans have taken the european union center of gravity is more likely to shift eastwards um as ukraine has been as a candidate country is something that they have already shared a status in a record time of less than 6 months but again as i said it's a candidate country uh, the prospect for ukraine has led to the inclusion of perhaps maybe moldova which is now also again a candidate country to the promise of the same fate for georgia but you know as they say greater attention needs to be paid to this during my interaction with scholars and experts who who really cover the european union uh, segment they are saying that what about the balkan countries so you you may have uh, you, uh, put up moldova as the candidate and let's say putting aside the candidature of ukraine as a potential candidate but what about the balkan countries who are already on their path to the eu it's not that the balkan countries have not applied to for the for the uh, for the eu uh, partnership or they've not grown in partnership with eu they've already been there they are already on the borders so the idea is what to do with them now Uh, even if let's say hypothetically uh, taking euro uh, taking ukraine and uh, moldova with respect to the european union uh, relationship into account uh, i still i still believe that the balkan countries are a bit far away and uh, this means that the situation uh, may open to more enlarged european union which according to my estimate uh, may grow as as large as 36 member states that is a union that all the more uh, you know became a continental after the british exit now it is in this context the the european political community which was essentially presented by emmanuel macron in strasbourg 
on uh, 9th of May 2022, they, they created a regular discussion, a regular forum between the heads of state and the governments, which are uh, of, of the whole continent. Now, the project was welcomed by both non-EU nations, medium-sized, as well as small uh, nations uh, at the highest levels. But the first meeting in Prague was attended by 46 countries, uh, which sh which shared that you know any discuss uh, which which explicitly told them that we are here to discuss Russia, without involve now again to uh, it showed it also showed a clear consensus that uh, a clear desire if I may say that um, uh, the continental affairs uh, you know cannot be discussed without involving Russia. So unlike the European security architecture of something that the President Macron promotes himself. Um, uh, the the meetings that took place in Moldova and then um, and, and in the United Kingdom uh, in times to come maybe if if they are in the in the charter, it will see how medium to long term uh, relation medium to long term prognosis of such continental organizations which not only cover the Council of Europe organization for security cooperation in uh, for in Europe or, or uh, that's a OSCE. European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, but also their independent and individual relationship with respect to Moscow. Because these unity may, may bring all of them unified into one particular platform for a greater security architecture in terms of against or uh, with some countries still talking to Moscow. It's, it's, too, it's, uh, it's, it's clearly, um, uh, I would say um, it's too soon to predict as to how this structure is going to come up when both France, when when essentially France is has not unequivocally, as I said in the opening remarks, um, uh, spoke about criticizing Moscow. Okay, so the picture you're painting is there is a moment for <clears throat> expansion of EU and a greater unity amongst EU, so that. It can securitize itself against Russia. That's the first thing which you, especially in the Balkan countries and the Central European countries, jumping onto the EU bandwagon. Ukraine admittance into EU is still not out completely, but it's there somewhere. And the third thing is there's a shift in the uh, French position, which says which is now looking at you know mending fences with Russia and getting peace back on right. And this is problem. This is not gelling well with uh, Germany, and so hence a new the tensions between Germany and France. Right? This is what you have painted. So, what is your assessment? Where do you think this is going? Uh, now, uh, the, my assessment is this is the the focus about uh, Russo-Ukraine war. There, there are two there are two balances for it. Now, what do you intend to do with it? So, do you intend to reorganize Europe? Because clearly, with uh, with such alliances coming together for a reconstruction, the focus is essentially on creating a balance, a diplomatic balance in Europe, uh, strengthening the European position, which is also uh, in a way that to demonstrate the European unity. But European unity and alliances, diplomatic dip diplomatic unity, and coming together, creating a new structure in uh, in you know in Europe is okay. This 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 masala is okay, but then the on the question of what are what are the French going to do with Russia? Um, is there most a bigger scholars, question? <laughs> yeah, most yeah. of the scholars and most of the most of those experts that I spoke at the forum, they were as confused as the way that the the the, the, the focus was streamlining in Paris. Um, Everybody was confused, and everybody unequivocally from the from the European side said that uh, you know uh, Moscow is a threat. So even the the pres even the president of Lithuania he himself said that you know it's a threat and it is going to come, and you know there are chances that uh, let us not take those chances, let us not take those risks. The unity is important. So okay. there is a there is a balance between unity and threat. But what to do with threat? Patani. But there is a unity. So unity okay. against <laughs> unity against what? Patani. Karna kya hai? Patani. Is there an engagement with Moscow? Patani. But there is an engagement okay. with Moscow, possibly. But okay. unity only chahiye. So this is the message. Okay. So that means that means certain things are shifting. There's a shift happening. 
and you went for this conference which is part of the shift and uh, it is only natural that in this kind of a shift there's some haze which will develop and you have to see through the haze and uh, but was there any talk of how to end the war between russia and ukraine now uh, it's very interesting sir um everybody talked about how the war is progressing on the question of where will this end there no was one absolute, knows. <laughs> absolute silence <laughs> <laughs> so you're t- you're talking of a unity without an end of the war this is an end of the war <laughs> and probably to that extent the uh, the war is driving them to a unity which will probably short lived at the end of the day so i I've, i've seen uh, i've uh, i've had a, a like a two day conference is like an hours and hours of discussion on the same everybody talked about moscow okay. and how moscow is come up but then what to do with moscow pata nahi no one <laughs> so knows the, okay. no one no, no one literally knows so, so it didn't throw up let, let let me sum it up as i see from what you have said the conference has not thrown up a solution it has thrown up a problem and has magnified the problem it has said okay because of this problem of the russia ukraine war we have to unite so unity is important but what to do with the unity they don't know how to take the threat out we don't know right and france has taken the pahal ke bhai baat to karo and to end the whole story that's probably and this is what the french stand has stance has been right from beginning that we need to talk to russia and you know talk him out of it that's what macron has always been saying in fact one year back he also went to france to uh, he went to russia to resolve this issue but he couldn't so so let's see where it goes so till then that is what is this so let's see what are the deliberations let me hear what the deliberations about the israel gaza conflict now sir uh, or rather israel hamas conflict yeah. I'm I'm in really awe with uh, the French diplomacy. To be very honest, it's my first time where I'm actually in the helm of a French. Uh, not I'm I'm not talking about European Union, sir. I'm talking about French, French diplomacy in terms of both in terms of Moscow. And I'm really they're very pragmatic. Let me be very categorical about it, sir. They're very pragmatic, and one of the really one of the importance of this uh, pragmatism is re- is resulted in Paris taking multilateral approaches. Uh, by incorporating regional partners, um, uh, understanding what the Washington's paramount paramount role is in in achieving regional stability, uh, in terms of uh, both in terms of Israel and uh, what is happening in Gaza. So they they have uh, the French uh, diplomacy is very pragmatic in this. Now, sir, um, there but then some scholars argued that there was a pendulum swing because this came after on January twenty eighth, uh, Paris hosted the talks between U.S., Israeli, Qatari, and Egyptian officials. and proposed a deal to further ho- release the hostages and perhaps engage in a long truce now uh, it was shown as the good illustration of you know france's role as a responsible um a responsible stakeholder as a responsible uh, i would say a nation uh, a, a power in the region bridging not only western and middle eastern players but also um you know uh, they don't have any any significant influence on the ground i mean uh, f- french do not have uh, the significant influence so even then they were very much active in engaging both middle eastern and western allies which is commendable and as the hamas israel war and other uh, and you know in addition to this the crisis evolved um it, the french is one of the few european countries to actually carve out a place uh in terms of the regional diplomatic landscape in in west asia in in, in particular in west asia during this conflict now uh, uh some observers actively criticize french uh, 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 france's um, uh, diplomacy and oh. they said that they've been increasingly favorable towards israel while others have accused of you know breaking the ranks with the west so they're saying uh, when the when the wind is flowing you should be a part of it but i would i would rather say that paris has taken an uh, a balanced position which is based on three key pillars if if i summarize it for for our audience security humanitarian and political now 
if you look at the French uh, uh, engagement with uh, privileged ties with the Arabs uh, at a time when it was not as divided and vulnerable as it is today, uh, the policy started, you know, the, the in, was very much under scrutiny under uh, Jacques Chirac. Um, he maintained many aspects of the Arab uh, engagements in terms of its policy, uh, op uh, opposing the 2003 invasion of Iraq. This is one thing that he did. And he also sought to warm relations with uh, with Israel, uh, something which happened after uh, Nicholas Sarkozy uh, came up in power. So uh, uh, France's unwavering solidarity with Israel is uh, October 7th was confirmed in the strategic orientation when when the when they were briefed, when Paris came out and brief the audiences as to this is so its political and counterterrorism support and counterterrorism actions were also driven by the fact that um 41 french nationals were among the victims of that assault and three are currently still being hosted so it is as personal as to israel probably not that intense but definitely france has uh, uh, has yeah, you know, got a stake in it as has taken it. Now, Paris is focused on sanctions against Hamas, including an EU initiative with Italy and Germany to perhaps form a European regime targeting the group leaders. This is what they've done. Now, at the same time, France became the, or the first major Western power to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Now, this is how you see that it is balancing its uh, decisions. Now, at the UN, it voted in favor of Brazilian and Emirati resolutions on the issue, uh, even which even those vetoed by the US. So uh, they've also approved the, the Jordanian and uh, Egyptian resolutions, which adopted by the General Assembly, you know, uh, unlike other uh, EU countries. Uh, Fran uh, France, uh, uh, or, or I would rather say Paris officials have increasingly insisted that, you know, some steps needs to be taken towards Palestinian statehood, which is, you know, it, it, is, it is a must in terms of identifying a political settlement. So they are also focusing on identifying a political settlement for the day after the Gaza war. So when they say when the Gaza war is over, the day after needs to bring in political settlement. So they've condemned statements by Israeli ministers. Um, and then they've also sought an active role in terms of humanitarian uh, front as well. On 9th of November, uh, it, they organized the first humanitarian international humanitarian conference in, for Gaza. And uh, their unilateral aid is a total of 100 million euros for 2023 including 77 million euros for uh, eu institutions which which you can see how you know the pendulum is swinging uh, from full throttle support of israel to it's say a even handed uh, you know engagement with observers who have noted that the french jewish and muslim community are among the largest in europe which is something i felt it i i've been here for a, for a, you know more than a week and it's something that i really felt now um, they've re-engaged on focusing regional partners, which is something uh, they've in 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 Lebanon. Uh, they've they are working closely with Egypt, Qatar, and Saudi to mediate a political crisis. Uh, consultations uh, with the U.S. is pretty active, so they're not only with the, you know, and we're they're also with the West and engaging with the with the Arab states. Um, as I said, um, they've they've set up a, a joint humanitarian mechanism um, in Riyadh. Uh, they also engaged with Western allies in terms of uh, receiving several joint declarations immediately after October 7, which says that um, uh, their proactive role, uh, they didn't they didn't sideline, they didn't uh, step back, but they were pretty much active on the second day. Now, on November 22nd, President Macron received the foreign ministers of the Arab League and a delegation from the OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation. He and his military, I mean, those from the military made numerous trips to the region, had phone calls with various leaders, including Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi. So uh, he is he's, he's proactive in in form of a, a post maintaining a posture that he that the U.S. led coalition in the Red Sea um, I would say some confirmed its reluctance of you know being boxed in um, by overtly Western format. So now this is the this is Paris going unconventional in terms of how Western politics work, and this also include. Um, you know, uh, uh, Paris engaging as part of the Operation uh, Prosperity Guardian, which aims of countering escalating, you know, threats against the commercial shipping in the region. But its forces does not take part in allied strikes against the Houthis. Now, this is very interesting. They are engaging, but they are not. So they are, they did not take part in the allied strikes against the Houthis uh, targeting in Yemen. Now, at the same time, President.
President Macron called for more cooperation in the state of Hormuz and the Red Sea during a, during the recent European uh, summit, uh, Council summit in January. A EU naval mission was, was you know, is, is likely to be deployed soon, um, which is something that has been uh, echoing in the corridors of the Paris, uh, you know, uh, forum uh, for for two days. Um, also, Paris, Rome, and other EU capitals have di displayed their own individual contentions towards this issue. Now, um, what I feel, sir, sir, one point. You know that EU naval task force to be deployed in the Red Sea and you know, that is an interesting development. Uh, that will be over and above the, what the uh, Americans are doing as they visualize it, or it will be part of that prosperity guardian. Uh, uh, so at that time, sure. at that time, you know, France will purposely, purpose have to act against uh, Houthis. So far, they have avoided the engagement. So, uh, is that what they're thinking? Uh, now, sir, it's very interesting because uh, no, no, this this argument is still under discussion. Nobody has okay. nobody has yet commented or has actually seen what the paperwork looks like. Is there a framework in place? If there is, how many naval vessels will be will be deputed by Paris, Rome, or or uh, the member states? So the idea yes, is, yes. If, they, if they are going to depute, then definitely Paris is going to be. But the more important question is, uh, sir, what's their mandate looks like? What is the mandate? Oh, yeah. What will they do? What will they do? What will they do? What will they do? Will because do. Operation uh, Prosperity Guardian is essentially a combat mission. This Co is what they're yeah, doing. It's a combat. It's a yeah. combat mission. But the, so, the thing that I get a sense of, or if if you if you would ask me for how the things are going, I would also say that um, Paris has taken one more step towards you know uh, U.S. cooperation. So um, taking all reservation aside, I see that uh, uh, Paris is well aware that the U.S. holds the key. Um, I would say uh, ingredient in stabilizing or knitting the fabric of the Middle East together. And if there is a truce in Gaza, which everybody is talked about, oh, it's it's within the reach, it's within the reach. But uh, to be very honest, I don't think so. It's within the reach. Um, uh, Paris and Washington could potentially join forces, and this is something that uh, Paris does intend to um, uh, to 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 actively engage with, yeah. with Washington. So let's see. You said you know. Everyone talks of peace, but it's elusive in Gaza and Israel. So, what is your sense you got out of that place? Uh, because sir, I think you know a, a lot of uh, yeah. We'll talk of that, and I'll talk of the divisions within Europe also a little later. Sir, so, sir, what is your sense? Sir, Do you think there's optimism, pessimism to reach peace? Now, uh, yeah, Paris is actively talking about uh, reviving the two-state solution in the longer term. Uh, this is something that uh, the Palestinian Authority is. It, it, so that means returning the Palestinian, you know, authority back in Gaza. But will will this be a fructified solution? Because clearly the Israelis, it's it's a bit different for uh, for the. It's personal to them. So um, it's it's highly unlikely for them to at least in certain conditions to revive uh, the the Palestinian Authority. Uh, they may have restructured it. I mean, it's it's going to be very different for them because it's personal. And they felt the heat much more than any uh, country. But that also means that Paris could draw uh, from this engagement formidable relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, whose decision making is critical uh, in in shaping the region's uh, at least as as a as a responsible stakeholder uh, partner yeah. with other allies. And they could push they could push to revive a two state solution as part of a broader strategy. Um, uh, perhaps uh, the Saudis uh, I'm talking about that they could push and they could yeah. involve uh, Paris to involve yeah. to, to yeah. in this in so this that part means of the yeah what you're saying is there could be a Saudi France you know push to impose a two state solution and get the Israel Gaza war to an end whenever it happens and give Gaza to the Palestinian Authority and revive the Palestinian Authority. Well, well let's see how it goes and where it goes. <laughs> because uh, these are all easy things and we don't know where it's going to end because there are intractable things which are there. And that is because of those intractable things only October 7 happened to start with. Okay. Now let me ask you a question. Okay. What is the impact of this Israel-Gaza war on the European society and European governments as a whole. Is there a divide? Because we keep hearing about this story uh, about 
the you know the government's acting one way the people on the streets acting one way and is there anything like that that you felt and uh, yeah yes sir i did i did feel that and uh, to be very honest it's a sensitive topic in paris uh, because as i said uh, the 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 my, uh, the majority uh, both in terms of so for, for the israelis uh, the uh, community here is pretty small um, the muslim community here is pretty big so that is yeah. about that is bound to happen tensions will happen so um now to get a sense of how the tension has risen is uh, not every scholar uh, in the forum was very much comfortable to even talk about it openly in a way that we talk about in india so uh, that means uh, the, there is a i mean there there were chances that even in university lectures according to some professors who i spoke to uh, in university lectures in classes uh students stood up and said you know uh, uh, professor i don't want to be i don't want to sit here during the class and when you teach israel gaza i want to be on the streets so there is a protest on the streets they want to protest on the streets so this is something a sentiment that has been reflected and uh, this is not only reflected by certain minorities or uh, muslim majority or certain you know religious um uh, i would say some some Uh, hardcore uh, uh, nationalists as well but this is visible to literally everyone who's witnessing gaza from their tv sets okay so that means there's a immigration problem which has morphed into a bigger problem it was just earlier a set of immigrants but now those immigrants have beliefs which they want to demonstrate on the streets yes. so they're going to hit the and this is this must be across the board in uh, entire europe and not confined to paris alone absolutely and, and this is yes yeah so we're going to have a turbulent future in that score also because this very divide if i may say or this conflict or this perception differences of perception between one class of people in a country and the other class of people in the same country and in similar countries means that it will be a driving force not to end the war they will uh, actively discourage any solution being sought and you know through whatever through street protests or opinions or whatever it is so we are at a interesting stage in this gaza <laughs> war but sir what you said is interesting is that france is doing something to finish the case and france is also doing its best to uh, get the ukraine russia war to a close right and yes. this could well be because of the fact that france is feeling the economic pinch yes and also could be and it's also feeling the social pinch because it's host to a large number of migrants right and who are all basically islamic uh, by ethnicity and uh, you know caste or rel- by ethnic eth- uh, not caste by religion so that is what you have painted so overall uh, how do you to wrap up today's discussion how do you feel in the end give a summary of the ukraine war and this war as you saw it from france and then we'll wrap it up uh sir uh, i am in awe and i really i'm i'm in literally in awe of france's diplomatic stance because at one point of time it is not shy away from going from traditional western approaches uh, on the other hand it is actually moving one step at a time to not only mend its relationship with the arab league or the arab states but it is during this process it is also talking about a two state solution which may potentially uh, uh, with the intent of potentially closing in uh, bringing in peace uh, in the region in spite of feeling the heat domestically so these these this is yeah. a very pragmatic yeah. this is very, a very pragmatic very active uh, foreign policy decisions that paris and, have taken and this is also you know um, i want to refurbish the add on is that it's also trying to run uh, end the russia ukraine war simultaneously yes yes potentially yes so it 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 is moving in that direction it is trying to move so it is in spite of being divided on both the fronts it is holding the fort very responsibly through its active and pragmatic diplomatic uh, uh, engagement and foreign policy which is really commendable sir which is something that i did not expect to see in yeah Ukraine. okay and so would it be fair to say that the center of gravity of uh, the european power has shifted from germany to france absolutely sir i will not hesitate to say this that uh, uh, paris has emerged 
bigger biggest player as as the key strategic player a biggest strategic player uh, which not only holds the engagement on the knit the fabric that binds the european union, union unity together but also does not shy away from going unconventional in its for in its foreign policy uh, i would say some as some scholars said violating the basic fabric of the same european okay. union unity um, in, in its foreign policy okay well, that's good i think you summed it up beautifully uh thanks a lot for your you know giving me your time and giving our viewers this time from france uh have a safe journey back and for all the viewers i would like to tell you i think later in the day he's going to start back and once anant is in uh, uh india we'll have a longer chat with him and what's more important is anant is going back to uh, france for the next 6 months very shortly at the ecole de militaire to do a, a fellowship come internship and we wish him all the best and i'm sure once he's in france he'll give us a lot of talks once he settled out there of what's happening in paris and or hopefully once he reaches france and paris uh, our talk we should be with the eiffel tower at the background <laughs> okay, not just a photo <laughs> the background <laughs> because i know for sure the ecole de militaire is just opposite the opposite. Uh, yes. opposite the eiffel tower have been there so i look forward to it in the meantime uh, anand come back have a safe journey and we'll reconnect when you come back thanks a lot jai hind and have a great day thank you sir